100 participants and dear listeners. Now, for the first time uh, in the history of the development of environmental law, a convention was adopted. And this convention was adopted in the year 1989. And this convention was adopted at Basel on March 22nd, uh, 1989. Most of you may be interested to know, was there a need to have an international convention of this nature? If there is a need to have a convention of this nature, why it was adopted? Now there is the history which is being written on this is huge voluminous. Now when I speak about huge and voluminous, this is nothing but the instances and the incidents and the devastating effect that were caused because of the dumping of hazardous waste. Now most of the uh, advanced countries, what we call as the developed countries of the world, they never bother to have dumping yards in their backyard. So when they did not thought, did not visualize did not dream of having what we call as the dumping yard in their backyard. Naturally, they wanted to shift this to almost all poorer countries. And these countries, they were called as the least developed countries or the developing countries became a victim. Now, although they became a victim, remember they were tolerating this, but then the developing countries, especially the African region felt enough is enough. Now this has to be condemned forthwith. And they met and then afterwards a convention was adopted. Now you may be interested to know what exactly is hazardous waste. Now when I speak of hazardous waste, hazardous waste are those waste which will have chronic effect on health and human environment. This is perhaps the simplest definition which is being given. So if any item which is produced he is going to bring about a chronic effect or an adverse effect on a health and environment. This is treated as a hazardous waste by everyone and by every legal system in the world. Now, when I speak of the history of the hazardous waste, naturally, I just mentioned to you, the colonial masters had taught good history for the rest of the rich countries. And these colonial masters, when they had taught Remember, the poorer countries had no option but to permit in the initial stages. And if the poorer countries did not permit, then they would indulge, the developed countries would indulge in inducement. And inducement of different types. They will give money. They will, remember, deposit money in the Swiss bank. And all sorts of means were done with so that the waste which is being produced by the developed world is dumped in the developing countries. Now, I would like to give you three or four instances so that you understand the point better. Now, one point, one instance happened to be Hooker Chemicals Limited. It was a, it was a plastic as well as chemical corporation registered in the United States. Now, the Hooker Chemicals Corporation had entered into an agreement with the city, city of Niagara Falls. And having entered into the, the agreement in the city of Niagara Falls, they started dumping chemical waste in the low canal zone. Now, now from 1942 to 1953, they went on dumping and on and on. And 15,000, remember, toxic chemicals, what we call as the, the serious effect, were dumped in this area. Now, what has happened was in the year 1970s, the corporation of the Low Canal Zone wanted to negotiate the matter. They just told the corporation, enough is enough, now give us the territory. And we intend to have a public school, a hostel, and a residential block. Now, in such circumstances, the, the, the chemi chemical corporation was very happy and the agreement was uh, entered to retransfer the territory to the authorities. When the retransfer had taken place, a hooker company wanted to introduce a particular section or a clause. In the section or the clause that was introduced in the agreement, it claimed 
no liability for dumping of these what we call as chemical waste or the medical waste in the area. Then afterwards, remember the authorities came, the school was built, hospital was built, administration started functioning. Now one fine morning within three months they came to know 200 families in the low canal zone were living on a dump site of deadly chemicals including dioxin. Then investigation started. Investigation started probing everyone. But then the company claimed immunity. It claimed we are not responsible. Nothing could be done. At a later stage, the state of the United States had to spend $100 million just to clean up the site. This was one instance which I just intend to bring home. Now, another instance happened to be an instance relating to the cadmium, cadmium lead waste, which has happened in the Minamata Bay in the state of Japan in the 1950s. Now, the cadmium lead the waste, chemical waste was released into the Minamata Bay. And the Japanese people, without knowing, started eating fish. They started, remember, using the water. Thereafter, remember, most of them, most of them, whoever consumed fish started suffering from deadly diseases and some of them could not be diagnosed. Thereafter, what has happened was there is a river which is known as the Zinzu River. And in the Zinzu River, the industrial waste led by cadmium, sulfur, etc. were released and thereafter, remember, it caused a disease which is known as uh, it hurts, it hurts. This is generally in English, it is called as a, a, a disease. Now, what has happened is a person's bone, a man or a, a, a man or a woman or a child, the bone would crash and it will be just like a pulp, it will get reduced. And the people, so many people lost their lives because of the release of this industrial waste, nothing could be done. So, in such a situation, naturally, the Japanese people remember wanted to have a legislation to prevent what we call as the release of these chemical waste into the drinking water, into the rivers or the canals, etc, etc. Now the third instance happened to be an instance wherein it is called as uh, United States versus mid-solvent recovery. Now there was a company specialized in storing of uh, what we call as the waste, hazardous waste, chemical waste, whatever. And it used to store this waste in uh, a dump site. They have purchased the dump site. And in this dump site, remember, huge, what we call as drums of 55 liters uh, were arranged. And in these 55 liters of the drum, all the chemical waste were stored. One fine morning in the entire vicinity, their fire caught up. And when the fire caught up, there were as many as 14,000 drums, minimum with the 55 liters of liquid waste. It may be chemical waste or it may be purely, simply as many as the, some of the drums went up to 250 feet high. And thereafter, the explosion took place. And the entire dump site, remember, had, could not be clear for months and months together. By then, the same owner, what he had done was he had applied for permission to get land near the nearby area. Having taken land in the nearby area, he had sh started shifting the entire equipment and other things to, to another area. Now, one fine morning, what had happened was in that place as well, there was explosion. When there was explosion in that place, remember, again, it was nothing but in the, in, the, in the first dump site, no cleanup operation has taken place. And sensational burnings on day-to-day -day basis were taking place. And chemical dump, which was dumped, had, remember, spoiled the surface of the mud or the earth. And devastating results of the vegetation, they got spoiled. And history repeated even in the second dump site. Then the United Nations uh, uh, Environmental Protection Agency stepped into, having stepped into, then the cleaning operation or the cleanup operations began even in this area. Now, the other instance happened to be 
an instance where in the developing countries were the least were the targets now without the knowledge government there was a military government then as many as 15000 tons of waste led by the deadly dioxin remember were brought and it was brought in the city of Coco. Having brought in, remember, vegetation started dying. Radio if active effects were, were, remember, visible in the circumstances such as this. Immediately, they came to know this was brought from Italy. The Nigerian government withdrew its high commissioner, its ambassador from the state of Italy, that is from Rome, and they imposed sanctions as well. But then, what has happened, what ought to have taken place, has taken place. And the damages could not be repaired that easily. Now, plenty of instances of this type is there. Now, the other important aspect I wanted to speak to you, this is the effect of dumping hazardous waste. Now, there are other side effects, for example, take it this way, in New Jersey, medical waste were dumped during summer. And ultimately, because of this medical waste that was dumped uh, in fine morning in the beaches, all the including the dead bodies, the cotton, and the material that is being used for purpose of operation were found. Now, the other thing is, even the, the, the doctors at later stage, when they diagnosed, went to the estate and finding out even hepatitis B material was also there. With the result, the beach was closed for almost six and a half months. 100, uh, 200 days it was closed and then it was opened. But then the damage to the exchequer due to the tourists was once, once for all closed. Now, the important part that I wanted to speak to you. Now, regarding the eatables, the Iraqis were fond of barley. And these Iraqis, when they were fond of barley, they would import it from the state of United States. The state of United States has exported barley to the state of Iraq. And afterwards, the Iraqis, especially Iraqi women, would make what we call as a mixture. Uh, this mixture it is like a paste of the barley. And this paste is actually put into the rotis, what we call as kaboos in the Gulf. So the kaboos were prepared and inside you find nice, remember, barley uh, paste. And all of them, all of them started suffering. First days they started suffering from diarrhea. Second day started suffering from a headache, and third day starting from vomiting, and afterwards lost their sensation. And fifth day, all of them were in the hospital. And when investigation started, and when investigation started to know that these barley which was sent or exported from the state of the United States were export, were infected with the fungi fungus, and they made use of it, and they had it. This is one such instance that I can say. Now, one other instance happened to be an instance relating to Latin America. In the state of Latin America, one year, especially in the Banana Republic, Costa Rica, the crop had declined. When the crop had declined, remember, there was almost, it was almost 2%. And in such a situation, what they had done is they had gone to the state it itself goes to the state of the United States and meets a chemical manufacturer. Having met the chemical manufacturer, they described the incident. Then he pointed out he is going to uh, prepare a particular spray. And this spray which is going to be manufactured is exclusively for the Banana Republic, Costa Rica. And afterwards, remember, uh, within three months, he prepares uh, this spray. And this is known as Capone. And Capon, naturally, then it was brought. Remember, in the container also, it was written exclusively manufactured by this company for uh, Costa Rica. And it was cleared by the customs in Costa Rica. And when once it is cleared, remember, it was distributed to the farmers. And the farmers, remember, without even, even wearing protective clothes, started spraying it. And after spraying it, Remember, first day, they got nausea. Second day, remember, diseases which are also, uh, uh, unknown to mankind. And the third day, instant death. And fourth day, half of them became paralytic patients. All of them were admitted 
And one instance which I just intend to tell you, remember it had a sociological issue as well. Now by the time uh, the recovery took place, nearly 1,343 women, they go to what we call as the matrimonial court and they sought divorce from their husbands because the husbands became impotent. What kind of situations are being caused because of the use of these pesticides? Now this is done with good intention. But then the manufacturer pre prepares this for money. But then he never bothered to take into consideration the human, you know, what we call as the lives and the persons who make use of this and the persons who ultimately consume, whether it is corn or vegetable. Now this is the kind of thing which, was, which has taken place in several incidents. Now we come back to the dumping of uh, hazardous waste itself. Hazardous waste, as I just uh, mentioned to you, is produced in large quantities by the West. Yes, statistics has been given. I'm giving the statistics of 1980. And this, they say, nearly 150 million tons of hazardous waste was produced by Europe alone. At that time, in the 1980s, the, the, the entire European community had only 22 two states. And today its number has gone up to 40 plus. And 22 states, remember, in a year, 150 million tons of waste used to produce. And another statistics uh, uh, points out is of the statistics of 1990, especially in the state of Philadelphia itself. Each person, remember, will be in a position to produce a lorry, full, heavy lorry of waste. It has to be in a year and that has to be uh, dumped in a safer dumping sites. Now the Western uh, countries did not bother to have dumping sites. But then their multinational corporations had very keen interest in dumping these hazardous waste, especially in Africa and Latin America. Most of the Latin American countries became victims of it. So is the case of Africa. Now, what had happened was the African countries uh, called a meeting in the 1980s. And at that time, Kenya had a very good president. He was a very strong president as well. And he was one but Daniel Arap Moi. Daniel Arap Moi of the state of Kenya, when he called a meeting of the African countries, there were more than 60. All of them joined in the presidential remark he pointed out. Now, this is what is called as garbage imperialism. Imperialism has come to an end. But then today we practice garbage imperialism. Do we call it neocolonialism? If it is not neocolonialism, I will call it as toxic terrorism. This is what this great man pointed out. Now from there, all the African countries united. Having united, they just wanted to put an end to this dumping once and once for all. But afterwards, remember in the next year they met, it came before the OAU, Organization of African Unity, a regional organization of African states. A resolution was adopted and this resolution, a resolution is popularly known as uh, Resolution Number 56. And in Resolution 56, the African states, all of them unanimously indicated that the dumping of uh, hazardous waste in Africa is illegal and it is criminal. So both words were used. It is illegal and it is criminal as well. And it is the responsibility of the state of Africa to prevent the dumping of these kind of hazardous waste by the multinational corporations. And we should act with the caution and precaution so that hazardous waste are not exported to the African continent. That is how it began. Now, when the African uh, Unity, OAU, adopted such a resolution, it requested the states to have legislations in regulating the waste trade. When it requested to have legislations by the members of the OAU, Organization of African Unity, remember a country, uh, for the Nigeria, as, as well as another country, they were the, uh, the, the first countries to have legislations on this subject. Now, when they adopted the legislation, the state of Nigeria pointed out if anyone exports and brings and dumps 
hazard is faced into the state of Nigeria, he will face death penalty. So for the first time, remember, punishment was death penalty that was imposed. Now, the second state happened to be the state of Ivory Coast. Ivory Coast, remember, did not adopt such a harsh legislation. It went to the extent of pointing out anybody who brings hazardous waste, which is harmful to health and environment, will be punished. And he will be punished up to a limit of 15 years to 20 years, as the case may be, depending upon the nature of the criminal act that is being perpetrated by him. Then it went to the extent of imposing a fine from 100 million francs to 500 million francs. Imagine, this is the first African country to put a fine, 100 million francs to 500 million francs. That is why they wanted to tell everyone and give a warning bell not to indulge in these kind of uh, acts. Now, when this was done, when these two countries enacted a legislation of this type, Latin America did not fall behind. In Latin America, for, remember, many of the Latin countries like uh, Honduras, Chile, Argentina, all of them, many of them, if you read the textbook, you will get to know all about 33 nations came forward. Having come forward, they wanted to have a legislation to prevent the transportation of hazardous waste into the American, especially the Latin American continent. This was done by the developed world. If the state of Germany, if the state of Denmark, if the state of Sweden, if the state of United Kingdom were interested in exporting their hazardous waste into the African continent and in a few instances to the subcontinent, remember legislations, they were warned not to indulge in this. Now, when things were shaking, taking shape like this, the European Economic Community, you know, remember, convened a session, a special session on this purpose. And the special session discussed this, and having discussed this, they adopted two important resolutions. Now you may be interested to know what two, what, which are these two important resolutions. The first resolution pointed out the concerned European states or the members of the European community are and must should adopt uh, a, an attitude to remember uh, bring in so many dumping yards. So more dumping yards is very much essential. Unless you have more dumping yards, remember the problem will be perennial and it will remain, it will be perpetual. And so no solution can be given. So that was the one. And the second one, it requested not to export hazardous waste to the African continent. The country should be very careful Without the consent of the African nations, no state should come forward and export hazardous waste to the African continent. These are the major, remember, two resolutions which were adopted by the European Economic, uh, EEC. Now, thereafterwards, in the meanwhile, the African nations as well as the Latin American nations wanted to have a convention at the international level. When they wanted to have a convention at the international level, Remember, they had to wait for the 43rd General Assembly of the United Nations. In the 43rd General Assembly of the United Nations, the African OEU members, as well as the Latin American states, pleaded for the adoption of an international community uh, to stop the transfrontier movement of hazardous waste into the African, Latin American, and other continents as well. Now, the matter was discussed with the General Assembly and the General Assembly, having discussed this matter, requested all states, first and foremost, to have their own dumping yard. And the second one is not to export hazardous waste without the consent in writing to the least developed country or the developing country. Now, activities were progressing like this. The General Assembly of the United Nations called the United Nations Environment Program. Having called the United Nations Environment Program to assist in the, in the adoption of a convention on the transboundary movements of hazardous waste. Now, the United Nations Environment Program, along with the, the top class officials, seized the issue. Having taken up the issue, remember the first drafting committee, so the first meeting had taken place in the Hungarian capital at Budapest. And that has taken place in the year 1987. So in the Hungarian capital at Budapest, they discussed all the matters, the experts 
all of them they discussed threadbare most of the issues and the second meeting was held at geneva and there afterwards the third meeting again had taken place in brazil and the fourth meeting actually took place at basel and having uh, discussed these matters in basel in 1989 on march 22nd the convention the basel convention on the prevention of the hazardous movement transformatory movement to hazardous waste was adopted in 1989 now you may be interested to know how many states had participated there were as many as 116 states who participated in the discussions 105 of them signed and 35 of them after the discussion in the uh, the convention was adopted put their signature now what exactly are the salient features of the convention is the next issue the basel convention on the transboundary movement of that space has 29 articles and a preamble so it has a preamble and 29 uh, articles it runs into the first original document runs into 53 pages and remember it required 20 ratifications to come into force and it came into force in the year 1992 now although it was adopted in 1989 remember to get 20 ratifications it took 3 years almost now that is the attitude of states in the progress and in believing in the development of international law it to get 20 years it took 3 years you might be knowing see for example you take an instance an instance relating to the united nations covenants even the united nations covenant on civil and political rights united nations convention on uh, economic social and cultural rights they were adopted in the year 1966 and remember they were adopted and moved and all the states agreed but then to get 35 ratifications it took 10 years it came into force only in 1976 that is the attitude lethargic attitude of states in believing in enforcing rules of international law the basel convention what does it say i just intend to speak to you a few of the major provisions of the convention which is being spoken between article 4 to article 9 now when i speak about article 4 of the charter the article 4 of uh, the basel convention it points out a state cannot export hazardous waste to a country that bans the import of it there is one first and first thing that is being spoken under article 4 a state cannot export hazardous waste into a country that bans the import of it the second one is a state cannot uh, export the hazardous waste to into another country a state cannot export hazardous waste into another country that remember prohibits the uh, what we call is the import one the second one is although the export is permitted without the consent of in writing you can So for, for example what is indicated in second is you can export hazardous waste to another country only if that state consented you does not consented in writing you cannot export hazardous waste that is the second now the third one that is most important that is being spoken is each state is supposed to have what we call as dumping yards so most of the states were requested to have their own dumping yards so that their what we call as problem is not exported health hazard problem is not exported by them to another developing or least developed country now the other important thing is how these dumping yards are managed when we speak about this the dumping yards must always be uh, very sound and it should be very sound maintain what we call as the health required standards as stipulated by the world health organization now in addition to this a, 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 a particular state is not supposed to export hazardous waste into a region or a particular conglomeration of group of states and even if it with permission it cannot be done because there are certain states who may oppose 
That is the point that is being spoken here. Now, in addition to this, um, it went to the extent of pointing out e under uh, the uh, under the annexures, especially each country is supposed to write to the secretariat which established under it the generation of hazardous waste, which is produced by that state. Those, for example, in the African states, a particular state like Congo, or a particular state uh, like you have plenty of them, uh, Venezuela in Latin America, how much waste they have produced. Then they have to report to the uh, secretary, secretary to the office which is being set up, how much and which are the categories of waste which are defined under their statute. Suppose, for example, if India has a legislation on hazardous waste, what are considered as hazardous waste? The entire list of hazardous waste which is being listed as hazardous under the law of the state of India has to be informed to them. Now, thereafterwards, the other important thing that is being spoken is each of the changes, suppose, for example, certain items are deleted in the definition or certain, certain wastes are uh, added. These matters as well should be brought to what we call as the Secretariat of the uh, uh, Basel Convention. So, waste definition, item, number of waste, number of the changes which are being made, these are to be brought to the knowledge of the Secretariat. Now, the other important thing that is being spoken is what steps each state has taken, play, has taken in the preceding year to prevent and promote what we call as the dumping of waste in their own country. Now, the most important is, first is to have dumping sites in their own territory. How many new dumping sites are created? How it is being uh, disposed? Was there any environmental problem? All these matters must be reported to the Secretariat by uh, uh, the concerned state. Now, when I speak about this, there is nothing like sovereignty. Many people always say states are sovereign, states are sovereign. Even the minutest particulars under environmental law, under the Basel Convention, had to be reported to the Secretariat. Those they should they take into consideration and it helps them to have a legislation of this kind. Now, most important thing is what exactly are the weaknesses of the Basel Convention? The weaknesses of the Basel Convention, first and foremost, uh, are two. Now, one important thing is it did not provide for a fund. See, developing and least developed countries will not adhere to the convention unless they are given technical assistance and financial assistance. The matter relating to technical assistance as well as financial assistance was not discussed at all. Although there was a discussion, no state was willing to contribute uh, simply. That was one of the weaknesses. Now, the other important thing is the Basel Convention did not speak about something relating to what we call as liability issues, liability and compensation. So, 1989 Convention, if you look into, it does not provide for liability and compensation in the event of an accident. Now, that is where, remember, when these two questions were uh, 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 harping upon on several states, especially the African states did not keep quiet. They pointed out the Basel Convention has come into existence, but then the waste trade has not stopped. The waste trade is going on in a different way. Now, you may ask me what is in a different way. Suppose, for example, a particular state, a developed state, in the definition, in their definition, uh, does not include a particular item as hazardous. Having not included a particular item as hazardous, it goes on exporting that state to another state. And nothing could be done. Although it is hazardous, it is not hazardous in their law. That is why the task of giving permission to define hazardous waste to each country under the Basel Convention is a misery which has cost to the entire uh, issue here. Because each one defines 
Now, what happens is if a certain uh, hazardous waste is being produced by a particular country, it may. <laughs> certain hazardous waste is being produced by a particular country, it will see to it that that is not included in the definition and that it will export. And when once it is exported, nothing could be done. And thereafter, it will say, no, it was not there and we have exported. And the teeth of a law is very weak to bite. Nothing could be done. Now, when we go further, for this purpose, these are the issues which were found in the year 1999. Before that, I just speak to you about the Bamako Convention. When the African continent criticized the very Basel Convention and its functioning, although with the Secretariat and all uh, the, the required information which are to be given to the Secretariat, they decided to have a convention which is known as Bamako in the year Bamako Convention in 1991. Now, the Bamako Convention for the first time openly said, now exporting waste into the African continent is criminal. And the concerned person who exports or the concerned corporation indulges in exports is answerable and he can be prosecuted. Now, these are the two things which were said. And they went to the extent of finding out dumping of waste even uh, in rivers and even oceans you know, in this, on the side of the African countries is absolutely prohibited. So what has happened was by then Law of the Sea Convention had already come into force. They said it cannot be dumped even on the coastal side or the coastal waters of these African nations. And it is absolutely prohibited and liability is strict. Now when these things were done, the African states were able to oh, do a lot of good things and they included but for the first time, uh, the other waste as well. Uh, along with the chemical waste, hazardous waste, they included nuclear waste and other as, as waste as, as well in their definition. Now, when we go further, in the fifth committee, uh, annual committee of the Hazardous Waste Convention, in the year 1999, adopted a protocol. Now, the protocol was adopted only to plug the existing loopholes, especially in regard to liability. So in the year 1999, uh, uh, in the year 1999, this matter was brought and the matter relating to liability and fund were brought in. Now, yeah, the, the protocol, what does it say? Well, the protocol which was adopted in the year 1999 points out two basic principles. Now, first and foremost, especially in matters relating to hazardous waste movement, the generator, the transporter, the disporter, disposer, as well as the carrier, all of them, all of them are equally liable. So remember, this was not there. And for the first time, it came in in the year 1999. So hazardous waste transporter, first is the generator, the one who generates. The, then the one who gives the notification and according to the notification, the one who transports and thereafter the one the who disposes, all of them are equally liable under the law. For the first time, it was indicated by the uh, uh, protocol. Now, the second one is they try to establish a fund and this fund is essentially based on uh, voluntary contributions. And when I speak about voluntary contributions, there was no compulsion as, as such. The developed nations, in order to give technology to the developing nations uh, to uh, uh, minimize the uh, release of hazardous waste, they should use good technology. If they use bad technology, remember it will have side effect as well. Now, for this purpose, they said the fund is very much essential. Now, when I speak of uh, the what we call as the 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 uh, generator, the transporter, and the disposer, all of them are liable. Now, the point at issue is over a period of time, after five or six years, they realized that the generator and the notifier, the transporter and the disposer will be in a position to claim immunity. Now, suppose, for example, the generator naturally gives the hazardous waste or transfer the hazardous waste to the notifier. And the notifier, remember, engages somebody to transport it. 
Now, in a situation of this type, if some accident were to take place, the generator will claim immunity. I am not there. I am not privy to it. I have sold. If you just go to the agreement and find out there is no liability from my side. Now, this is one. The other important thing that is being spoken is, now, for example, the generator simply transport to the disposal and or through the uh, carrier. And when he transport to the disposal, the same person, the carrier will say, transporter will say, I am not liable because it is already handed over to him. Now, it is very difficult to prove the privy and what we call as the, the guilty mind, mensria in cases of this kind. Now, thereafterwards, the other defect which is found is in almost all the cases, all the cases, remember, they go, go to the extent of uh, referring the matter to the municipal law of respective states. Now, when I speak about the municipal law of respective states, remember, the municipal law is at times totally maybe different. And the award of compensation is maybe totally different. And you may not get the compensation to the extent of the loss suffered. And they may refer to other branches of law as well. For example, uh, if you take into consideration the Indian Penal Code itself, you have several uh, uh, sections in the Indian Penal Code. For example, uh, for negligence, for willful act. And uh, if the dumping takes place due to willful act, and then dumped due to negligence, or it is by coercion. All these matters, remember, you have separate liability as well for this. And but then with the question of main liability, who is going to give and who is going to award, who is going to take up the compensation? This was, remember, a major criticism that is being found out. Now, the other thing is they went to the extent of finding out liability is strict. Now, when I speak about liability is strict, remember, for strict liability, you have exceptions. And when you have exceptions, especially in a local court, naturally, under the exception clause, it is an act of God. We are not in a position to control who will get the compensation and who is going to be reimbursed. The loser is a loser forever and he will suffer forever and gone is gone. Nothing could be done. Now, this was the interpretation that is being given. Now, in regard to the other important aspect that is being spoken is uh, the compensation fund. Now, when I speak about the compensation fund, the compensation fund that is being established uh, was not acceptable. Now, first and foremost, the compensation fund is not acceptable for two, two, two important reasons. The first one that is being spoken is uh, the compensation fund is based on the collective voluntary contributions. And it, in the event of an accident, it does not believe in what we call as polluter pay principle. Now, what they say, especially the state of Australia as well as the state of Canada have gone that far and went to the extent of finding out as far as the, the liability issues are concerned, we are not with the Basel Convention. Because under Article 11 of the Basel Convention, that is a provision. And 11 simply points out that the parties are empowered to adopt some other procedures as well in matters relating to compensation. So other, other provisions in regard to compensation was good enough for the state of Australia as well as for the state of Canada to go to other important things yeah, that is actually a polluter pre principle as well. And they, they cared, they did not even bother to, we will have our own regime because remember our area should be pollution free, hazardous waste into the uh, Australian continent and the Canadian continent should not come. Now, that is how it is being spoken. But one important aspect that I just intend to tell you that the, uh, the, 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 the protocol on liability and compensation has come into force very recently. That is in 2020. And uh, uh, the, there they provide money so that uh, the, the, the transportation of hazardous waste into a developing country and a least developed country should stop once for all. And it requests for the states to have their own dumping yard so that their waste is not exported and cause problems of, of environmental matters into the developing countries. Now, these are the major uh, theme under the Convention on Hazardous Waste. Now, the state of India has adopted in the year 1989 a, a hazardous waste management rules. 
and this was not enough that was meant only it had only limited the scope but then in the year 2016 the government of india adopted what we call as the hazardous waste transportation rules what should be done the ministry of environment and sustainable development is the ultimate authority and from whom you have to take permission and only after the permission this could be brought or it could be dumped now most important thing that is being spoken is in the entire convention the transfer of technology for the reduction of the production of waste that has not taken place sincerely the developed states they were not interested to give the technology and in few cases even even if they have given they have given the technology of a second rate there are plenty of instances in african countries and this is how the the writers in the state of uh, in the african continent they go to the they point out and criticize this See, there are in plenty of instances in international law where in states when they need protection they just go to seek the protection of international law even before international courts when they are in trouble and if the existing rules of international law is going to help them naturally they go and plead international law is violated this starts from the big brother and this starts even from the developing countries as well and remember there are plenty of instances where any international law is violated and when international law is violated remember even the other countries point out no we we are sovereign and states are sovereign and sovereign you know, the, the united nations cannot interfere remember in the domestic jurisdiction of a state article 2 paragraph 7 now one important thing that is i just intend to speak to you again matters pertaining to environment now initially most of this transportation or the transfrontier movement of hazardous waste have taken place with the connivance of the african rulers there are plenty of instances wherein remember hundreds of thousands of acres of land were given without the knowledge of the people of africa or without the knowledge of the concerned people so in such cases naturally they were taking a defense saying that we can't do anything because they have given permission and when they have given permission we have exported it now there is one more clause that is being say, taken suppose for example which i forgot to tell you i think article 14 now if a particular state uh, exports hazardous waste to a developing country and this developing country or the least developing country does not have the dumping ground so in situations like this they are supposed to receive back the hazardous waste or make provision to dump the hazardous waste in a reasonable sustainable manner that is what it points out now suppose for example a particular state transport hazardous waste by indulging in fraud coercion all those contract provisions from uh, remember 12 to 17 and the influence all of them are there now in such situations naturally if it comes to know if it is proved then it is the duty of the sender to receive back the concerned hazardous waste that is what these are the two provisions now very good provisions but here also the difficulty is to prove how will you prove without sabut nothing can happen anywhere now they say so many things but then it has to be proved now in the international community as far as the question is concerned ultimately it is left to the attitude of the states now professor bavet a professor of international law one of the most learned scholars in international law answers this way when once you ratify the convention the concerned state which has ratified and expressed its consent to be bound by the treaty is not supposed to abrogate from the provisions of the treaty and that state will be looked down before the united nations this is one the second important thing that is being spoken professor by professor bavet discussion as such never tend to mount in uh, intervention when instances of this type a particular state violates rules of international law it does not believe in the charter of united nations or it does not believe in what we call as the basel convention of human right uh, on transplanted movements of hazardous waste naturally it, a discussion will take place and when a discussion takes place you cannot say that you are intervening in the internal affairs of another state because there are plenty of instances 
If you read Bhagavad, he gives you at least 100 instances wherein he go to the extent of finding out discussion under the United Nations system. Remember, as such, never tantamounts to intervention. So these are the two remedies. In such as my professor, Professor R.P. Anand used to say in the classroom, now if somebody has caused harm and due to this, a nation is made to suffer, shout before the floor of the General Assembly. You have to shout so that the others are made known. You might be knowing one instance, an instance relating to the state of Israel. The state of Israel, remember, in the 90s when it addressed the United Nations, all the members except five states decided to boycott. That is how the expression of intent is shown to the rest of the world community.